back in Blender and you'll notice that we have the point light renamed now. This is my startup file. I saved the startup file last time by renaming the point light. Remember, we do this by going to File, Defaults, Save Startup File, and now it's what I want coming in again. Let's hide the camera, the target, and the point. Remember that we can do this by clicking on the eye, holding down the left mouse button, and dragging down. So if we want to hide everything, drag down like that. If we want to show everything, click drag down like that. Easy to do, very quick. It's a nice feature. And we're going to be, what are we going to be doing now? Um, we're going to be sculpting a rock. All right, well, let's get rid of the cube. Delete the cube. As I said, we'll start by using Shift A, Mesh, Icosphere. And we're going to change the Icosphere default options by clicking on this little triangle here and increasing the subdivisions to let's make it yeah let's make it six in fact so you can see we've got a lot of geometry already in this we can barely see the faces we have 10,242 verts if we look down in the information bar at the bottom. Sometimes this disappears incidentally. You'll notice that you can actually pull it down and it disappears. And the way you get it back again is, well, if you go too far down here, then you bring in the Windows menu bar, which is really irritating. So we actually have to reduce the size of the window. And we go here and... I think I've just killed the menu. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so you actually hover over the lowest part of the window till you get the double-headed arrow. Left-click, drag. Oh, that didn't do it. The next one, left-click, drag. Yeah, then you get it. So the absolute lowest arrow is actually resizing the window. The one about a pixel above it is expanding and contracting the information bar at the foot. But once you're used to it, it's not a big deal. The only problem is that if you've got, as I have, the Windows menu set to scroll in, then it's going to hide your option for that. You have to reduce the window. Okay, enough of that. So here we are. We've got a lot of geometry here. That's fine. I'm going to call this one underscore rock. There you go. Don't care about the material right now, and you'll see why in a moment. Let's go to a tab we haven't used before, the Sculpting tab. This is kind of a fun one. I don't use the Sculpting tab professionally, the Sculpting mode professionally, because it's not what my clients want, but this is pretty good. Blender has a pretty good sculpting mode. It treats your mesh like it was digital clay. And some people just spend all their time in it. They love it. They create creatures. They create people. They create sculptures. Whatever. If you want to do this full time, and some people do, then you probably want ZBrush. ZBrush is the, the ultimate sculpting tool, I believe, though Mudbox from Autodesk is a, is a pretty close rival. Here are the tools down on the left-hand side. And if we hover over them, we can see clay, clay strips, we've got layers, we've got inflate, we've got blob, a whole bunch of stuff. I'm going to go to flatten, which is this sphere with a flattened northeast corner to it and click on that so that it's highlighted or highlight blue and let's just see what it does left click and drag over the surface a few times let's just scrub the mouse back and forth and then when we hold down the middle mouse button and tilt around you can see what it's done it's made a very slight flattening impression on the surface 
and for some reason it's done it on two sides. Why is that? Well, in sculpt mode, the X symmetry is on by default because most of the time people are making faces, they're making people, they're making animals, which by and large, more or less, most of the time are bilaterally symmetrical. So let's disable the X symmetry. X, Y, and Z are all grayed out, they're all inactive. I'm going to hold down Control and hit Z to go back to the original sphere. And now let's look a little more at all the options we have up the top here for this flatten mode. The radius. This is the radius of the brush, for want of a better word, the tool. And you'll notice the radius stays constant no matter how close in or far out we zoom. So if we want to change the size of the brush effectively, we can just zoom in and out with a scroll wheel. There are other ways of doing it. The strength. Part of the reason for not having much effect with this tool was the strength is only at 0.5. I'm going to whack it up to 1. OK, that's a little more impressive. Control Z. Can I take it any further than 1? No, I can't. Actually, I can. I can take it up to 10 if I want but we probably don't want to use a strength of 10. Let's make it 2. All right, that's a little better. So I'm going to have it at strength of 2. Next to that, we'll see a plus and a minus. Well, it defaults to minus, which is pushing in. If we have it on plus, it's pulling out. Pushing in is good for right now. Brush. Here are all the options for the brush. Worth experimenting with these. I'm going to offset the plane to minus 0.1 of a meter. More or less. And the reason is that I want to push this in to a specific distance and stay there. The other thing I'm going to select in brush is original normal. So what that means is the brush is going to push the pixels, the faces of this blob of clay in along the direction of the original normal face that I started brushing from. So I'm going to be pushing a plane in. It's almost like I'm slicing something off the cube. Let's see what that does. Do you have like a little red line following your cursor? I accidentally somehow... Uh... Oh, that's the smoothing? Uh, yeah. Um, da, 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 da. You might have enabled smooth stroke. Yeah, which which is I mean it's it's actually quite useful, but maybe not exactly what you want right now. And you notice here that it actually is keeping it in the plane of the original pixel, so it's pulling out. It's not pushing in so much, even though we've got the minus selected. If I move around and start brushing from a different face. I'm starting to build up something. This is not quite what I want, incidentally. Uh, I used to be able to do this much better in the old sculpt mode, but they've changed a few of the options. I haven't quite got used to them yet. But just spin the sphere around and use the smooth brush to create a kind of faceted rock like this. Yeah, be careful about some of the. It's it's a little, it's a little unpredictable. Control Z is your friend sometimes here. I'm actually going to take the strength down to 1.5. I'm still getting used to these values. Yeah, 
Yeah, actually, it's a bit better. And you can see if I happen to start clicking over a face like this, almost underneath the sphere, I'm creating a face that's parallel to that original normal. So we don't need to keep spinning this around so much. We can just start in a different location and we get a different face. So let's not worry about this too much. This is something that you can experiment and practice with. This crashed my program. I, I was using a hypersphere and I gave it 12. So 12? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, you deserve all you've got. Yeah, I'm sorry. You never use an icosphere with 12 degrees of subdivision. That's insane. That's like, you know, quantum supercomputer level. I don't even know why they allow 12 degrees of subdivision. So this is a um, pretty crummy, this is a pretty crummy rock, to be honest, but it'll do for now. So I'm going to go back to layout, and here's our run. Oh boy, look at that. That's a lot of this. 20,480 faces. Okay, that's too much for what we want. We're going to be populating an island with a whole bunch of these rocks, and we really don't want to have 20,500 faces on them. So what do we do? We can do, incidentally, do you want me to pause at this point? Are we good so far? Reasonably, this, I will post this um, soon. Okay, so let's make another icosphere. We haven't moved this icosphere. We've dinged it about, but we haven't moved it. So I'm going to hit Shift A, Mesh, Icosphere. I don't want it to be six. I'm going to make it three. Subdivisions three, and I'm going to whack the radius up to the point where it's completely surrounding the original sphere. It's surrounding the rock. Okay, that's good. Now we're going to use another modifier. Modifiers are great with a couple of caveats, a couple of warnings. Modifier shrink wrap. Under the deform heading, modifier shrink wrap, very, very useful. Wait, I, I, I'm, I feel like I'm stuck on the surface of my first rock. How do you. You're oh, stuck on. On the screen of the first rock? You go back to layout. Oh, yes, sorry. Were you, oh, were you in sculpting? Yeah. Yeah, you want to be back in layout. Okay. Because we're now going to add a new object. Uh, I put I put three. Two is probably too low. Four is probably too high. But you've got to use your own judgment on this, and increase the radius so that it surrounds the original rock. There is no point at which the original rock pokes through the surface of the new icosphere. And we add. A shrink wrap modifier. Not a lot of difference. You'll notice that the word shrink wrap in the modifier tab is in red, which means that something's not right, it's giving us a warning. Well, obviously, we don't have a target. So we click in the target box and hey presto, what have we got that we can use? We got one underscore rock. Ah, now. Look at what's happened. The shrink wrap modifier has literally shrink wrapped the new icosphere mesh around our high resolution rock. We couldn't have used a an icosphere of resolution three because that's not enough geometry for sculpt mode. But we can now wrap a an icosphere of level three around a level six icosphere that was sculpted and get pretty much the same result. We can, if we want, offset it, make it a bit bigger, though of course it smooths it out, make it a bit smaller, though then we start getting weird overlapping faces. So you want to keep the offset 
at, at zero, probably a good idea. I'm just going to enter zero here. But there is the option to offset the surface, but which is useful for some cases. All right, mode near a surface point on surface. Let's just leave those alone. All right, so we don't want to see this icosphere. We can hide it. Uh, oh, sorry. My, uh, my cube, on that, or my, no, sorry, my icosphere didn't actually wrap correctly. Um, how did it not wrap correctly? Uh, when I went to do shrimp wrap, I chose uh, a Oh, no, never mind. We all good? Never mind. All right, good. So shrink wrap, if we choose the rock and we then say, okay, we don't need this anymore, delete, our new icosphere goes back to what it was because it's lost its target. Anybody want to suggest what we should do with the icosphere? Apply. Apply, excellent. Apply the modifier. Now we can go back to the original rock and we can just delete it. Freeze up our scene. Now we've got a presto. We've got a reasonably convincing rock, more or less. But, 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 it's all flat shaded. Let's select it and make it smooth shaded. Well, that looks a bit like a melting snowball or possibly like a rock that's been rolling around on the seashore for several thousand years and had all the sharp edges knocked off it. Incidentally, this is a rendering artifact because um, one of the faces has got squished into the other face. Let's not worry about that right now. Rendering artifacts in rocks, we don't really worry about too much. So I want some of these edges to be sharp and the others to be smooth. A smooth rock has been rolling around on the seashore. A sharp rock has just been chipped off a cliff. So depending upon the style of rock we want, we want to adjust the balance between smooth shading and flat shading. And the way we do that is with, yes, yet another modifier, edge split. Edge split is under generate. Click on that. And now you can see the default edge split angle is 30 degrees. This isn't actually looking too bad. Some of it's smooth and some of it's still sharp. If we click and drag on the split angle, we can make it sharper as we go down. We can make it smoother as we go up. So choose a value that seems okay to you, and if you want to, you can apply it, or if you think you might want to change it later, just keep it as it is. All right, let's make a new collection. Remember that collections are like layers used to be. Layers, I believe, have completely disappeared from Blender now. I'm going to click on collection here, double click and call it C. I want to make a new collection using this little icon at the top right. Here's a new scene, scene one, which is inside the original scene. And I'm going to call that reference. And I'm going to drag it, if I can, all the way down to the bottom here so that it's not inside the scene. So let's look at that again. We select reference, drag it all the way down so that it's at the same level as the scene. And we can hide it. Well, there's nothing in it. So that's not going to make any difference. Let's rename Icosphere to underscore rock and drag that down to the reference collection. Now we can hide that rock by just hiding the reference collection. And if we want, we can hide the seed. Don't know why we want to do that. 
but we certainly probably generally want to hide the reference material. So I'm just going to uncheck that. So we've got our rock available, but we don't see it. It's not interacting with the scene. It's not interacting with our design process. Now we're going to use another add-on. Let's go to Edit and Preferences, Add-ons. A lot of options here. We can scroll up and down with the mouse wheel. We can also hover over to the right side and you see a scroll bar appears. We can click and drag on this slider and oh boy, we've got a lot of add-ons here. We want ANT landscape. I don't see where it is. That's okay. We just type in land. There it is, ANT landscape. And again, you'll see I've already enabled it. Uh, to enable it, yours probably won't be enabled. Just click in this little box. It may take a couple of clicks. Sometimes Blender is not particularly receptive to enabling add-ons for some reason. You've got to click a couple of times. Another noise tool, ANT. So it's not ANT. If you search for ANT, you won't find it. It's a dot n dot t dot, another noise tool, landscape. Okay, and I'm just going to close. Shift A, mesh. Now, underneath Suzanne the monkey, we have landscape. Let's click on landscape. Oh boy, we have a huge dialog box here with many, many, many options. This is a very interesting add-on. It uses pseudo-random number generation to create moderately convincing landscapes, depending upon where you want to set your animation. Um, this noise type, this is the default hetero terrain. Well, hetero terrain sounds very boring. Let's go to Planet Noise, Planet Noise, a different kind of landscape completely. Let's go to Multifractal. Where's Multifractal? Lost it. Uh, well, Hybrid Multifractal, much smoother. Let's go to Strata H Terrain. So we can see this is kind of stratified. Incidentally, I'm not able to zoom in too closely, so I'm going to click on the toggle ortho perspective option, this grid here, and I can see it a little more closely. And let's get some more real estate in the 3D window. There we go. I'm not going to right click and shade smooth because guess what soon as I smooth shade it I've lost all my configuration options even if I hit control Z it's not going to work so just delete shift a mesh landscape again and you'll notice it comes in exactly the same because it remembers the previous settings which is neat okay when we change any of these though any of these values in the dialog box for the ANT landscape, we don't change it so that we stop being able to edit it. Let's go down here. What else have we got? Water plane right at the bottom. Okay, let's add some water. Click on that so it turns blue. Now, if we scroll down even more, we've got some water. So let's make some water around our little island. Back up again. The fall off. What's the fall off? None. It's a completely open-ended section of a landscape. If we have the fall off along the y-axis, then it's defined down to zero along the y-axis. Along the x-axis, it's still open-ended. Yeah. It has rock. 
Yeah. I'm sorry? It has a theme for generating rocks, too. Does it? Yeah. That's new. <laughs> oh. Oh, no. Okay. At the very top. What, right at the top? Yeah. It's the preset. There, operator preset. Oh, this is new. <laughs> Damn. This is straight up like a rock. <laughs> Slick. Oh no! Wait a minute. That's no. That's not rocks. No, go to rock. It has a rock. It has rock. Yeah, just straight up rock. Oh, it has a rock. <laughs> okay. Well, never mind. You know, this being able to make a rock in sculpt mode is useful. Damn it. So yeah, this is actually a rather good rock. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right well as we saw in the break just have low expectations of this class all right particularly low expectations of the instructor all right well okay let's um let's um slide on by that uh how do I? Oh yes, uh, operator presets. Canyon. <laughs> this is completely new. This is wonderful. Cauliflower hills. Mm, okay. All right. So I've I've got my work cut out over the weekend, just going through all this stuff. But yeah, let's just go for landscape. If we can go back to where we were, I don't know if we can. Um, operator restore defaults. That didn't do it. Default. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so yeah, that enough enough messing around. This is this is going to be our island, all right? Something like that. You can choose whatever you want. And again, water plane. It's right at the bottom. As soon as you enable it, you can scroll down a bit further. And I'm going to pull this up. It's a little insensitive. I'm going to hold down the shift key to get a little more control. If you hold down the shift key, remember, you increase the sensitivity of the mouse. So you've got a little finer control in when you're dragging in these dialog boxes. And all right, that'll, that'll do it. I think that's going to be fine. This is our landscape with the water. I'm going to scroll up and reduce that. Okay, we're going to add some rocks to this landscape. Make sure that just the landscape is selected. For obvious reasons, you don't want to have the water selected as well. And we're going to go down to this icon here which looks like a large dot spewing out three smaller dots at 45 degree increments. This is particles. Click on this. Okay, not very exciting. We have to click on the plus key to add a particle system. Whoa, and we've got a huge dialog box here. Many, many more things that we can do with particles. Particles are fun. By default, the particle system is an emitter. What does an emitter do? Well, let's drag up to see the timeline and scrub along the timeline. This is what it does. It emits things. If we go down to velocity and give it a little more oomph, say two meters a second they're gonna they're gonna bounce up further if we make it say five meters a second then this island turns into a volcano and it's exploding and lava is going everywhere and so on these dots incidentally are placeholders they can be objects they can be image planes they can be smoke trails, they can be all sorts of things. But we don't want an emitter. We don't want rocks exploding out of our island, or at least not yet. So what we're going to be using is hair. Yeah. So we've got a hairy island here. 
we have an extremely hairy eyelid. Let's reduce the hair length. Click drag. So it doesn't make a great deal of difference in this case because we're just using hair for the location, but at least it looks a little more reasonable. And you can, in fact, use hair for creating grass. You can use it also to spread rocks and to spread trees and to do lots of other interesting things. But by default, hair is for well, hair and grasses and fur and that kind of thing. Let's take the number down from 1,000 to more reasonable, about 300 or so. So 300 rocks. Hair length is about a quarter of a meter. And notice that our island is actually two meters square. So it's more like a rock itself. And that's fine. Now we want to replace the hairs with the rock that we created earlier. We'll go down to Render. Expand the Render tab here. I'm going to close Emission. Expand the Render tab. Render as Path. We want to render it as an object. When we render as Path, obviously that's our hair. So that's how we create hair on a person's head, how we create fur on an animal, how we create grass in a landscape. But we want to use object. Now, when we choose object, we've got an option for object here. Instance object. Instance. Did I mention instancing already? Oh, I should have mentioned instancing. Instancing is where you use one object and you make copies of it, but all the copies are simply reflections of the original object. So if you've got one chair in a scene, and well, let's actually do that right now. I'm going to add a cube. I'm going to move it over here, and I'm going to go into edit mode, and I'm going to move this top down. And I'm going to give it a couple of uh, edge loops there. Scale along the x-axis. Oh, what's happened here? Talking and not thinking. Sx. There we go. And then another edge loop here. Click Sy. And then we go to edge mode, one, two, three, four, E, that's our legs, one, two, three, E, that's our back, G, Y, pull it back, give it a subdivision surface, and we'll make it two, and we'll just tighten it up a little bit. All right, so something like that. There's our chair. And we'll make it smooth shaded just because it's better that way. So there's our chair. And we're going to copy it. Control D. Wait a minute. Sorry, Shift D. X. Incidentally, there's our Z fighting. So... I've made a copy of the chair. I should have named it. Let's just undo that. We'll call it one underscore chair dot zero zero zero. Enter. And then shift D X. Move it along the X axis. Now we've got chair zero zero one. These are copies. If I go into this one and mess about with it, it doesn't change that one. However, if I select the original one and use Alt-D, not Shift-D, but Alt-D, 
and x. We still get an incremented number. It's now chair 002. But when we go into edit mode with the tab key, you notice that both of these go into edit mode. When I change one, I change the other. This is what an instance is. An instance is not only tied to the original object, it doesn't add anything to the scene. There is no geometry here. It all refers back to the original one. It's this geometry repeated with three meters to the left on the x-axis. That's all it is. This one is new geometry. That's why I can change it and get something completely different. And you can instance objects, you can instance materials, you can instance particle systems, all sorts of things. But there's a fundamental difference between instancing and copying. So say, for example, your client wants 60 chairs in a restaurant. And Two days down the road, as clients do, they decide they want the chairs to be slightly taller in the back and slightly rounder in the leg and different proportions. If you've instanced those chairs, then no matter how you've distributed them around the tables, you've rotated them, you've even scaled them, you've moved them. When you change one, you change all the rest. That's, that's where instancing is really valuable. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry, I should have talked about this before. I thought I had. It's fairly fundamental. Anyway, let's go back to our landscape. And particle systems. Uh, here it is. So when it says instance object, what's the original object that we want to instance? Well, it's our rock, which is on this hidden scene wherever that is. Yeah, reference there. It's grayed out. It's hidden. But we can still see it. We can still see it in the pop-up list. So let's choose two underscore rock. Okay, and there are all our rocks instanced around the scene. They're a bit small. Let's increase the scale. They're a bit alike. Let's increase the randomness of the scale. What else could we do with this? Why isn't this rock distribution very realistic, in your opinion? I'm sorry? They ought to be clumped more. Exactly. It's the distribution. They should not be at the top. They should not be sitting on steep slopes. They should, as you say, all be gathered at the foot of the slopes around the shores of the, of the island. So we need to change the distribution. Right now, this particle system is evenly distributed over the surface of the mesh. How are we going to change that? Well, for one thing, I'm going to hide the water so you can see this a little more clearly. And I'm going to go into weight painting. We want to weight paint this. We don't want to texture paint this. Texture painting is not weight painting. Weight painting is actually a different mode. It's like edit mode. So object mode, edit mode, sculpt mode, weight paint. Let's go into weight paint mode. And the landscape turns blue. The reason the landscape turns blue is that blue is cold. It means that all the faces in this landscape have a weight value of zero. So effectively, there's no selection taking place on the rocks. Click and drag. And you'll see we're painting a trail. A trail that's red in the middle, where the weight paint is 1, its highest, and it fades out towards the edges through yellow and green 
and light blue, and then out to zero, which is the dark blue. What this is doing is telling, or it will be, telling the particle system where to place the rocks. Let's bring the water back so we can see a bit better where to do this. And I'm thinking this is a little hot. We want to use maybe a, a reduced weight for this brush. There is a way to change it, which is now in itself changed. I'm going to hold, I'm going to hit the F key, hold down the F key, and drag and click. And yeah, let's change the size so that's not it. Uh, Shift F. Yeah, Shift F. So this is not intuitive. Okay, to change the size of the brush, click on the F key and resize it. F, release the F key, resize. F, move the cursor, click again, resize. To change the weight, to change the strength of the brush, hold down Shift and tap F. And then move the cursor. You don't have to have any buttons pressed down, but move the cursor. And the number in the center is the weight of the brush that you're painting with. So I'm going to paint with about a 0.25 weight of brush. And now you can see I'm not painting red anymore. I'm actually painting green. If I keep going over, I'm painting with a slightly darker green. If I keep scrubbing back and forth, I'm getting yellow. And if I keep scrubbing forth, back and forth again a bit more, I'll start to get red. But this is a much more gradual way to create your weight paint. So remember, tap F and release to change the size of the brush. Hold down Shift, tap F and release to change the strength of the brush. And now I'm going to scrub around here. At the foot of the slope, just increasing the weight paint here. Remember, the, the hotter it is, the more likelihood that the rocks will be here. It doesn't guarantee the rocks will be there. It depends how many rocks there are. You could just have two rocks. But the hotter the color, the more likelihood that a rock is going to be sitting in that particular area. Just scrub around. Just paint. Happy little island. This is your world. Da -da -da. Channeling Bob Ross. There we go. Something like that. Okay. Well, as we can see, this really hasn't done a lot for our rock distribution. We've got a weight paint, okay, but it's not doing anything. How are we going to tell the particle system that we want to use this particular weight distribution? Let's go back to object mode. Now we can't see the white paint anymore. Incidentally, this is quite an attractive way of looking at the viewport shading. What I have is I have outline enabled. And we could have cavity enabled, which gives the cavities some shadow and the faces directed towards us a little bit of glossy shine. You can see the difference here. It, it just makes things pop a little bit more. It's easier to work with when we're developing a model. So again, shaded mode, or sorry, solid mode, as Blender calls it. Enable outline, enable cavity. But there's a whole bunch of other things you can do. You can have x-ray if you want, though. That's really helpful. I'm sorry? It really helps with the way you can actually see it. Yeah, yeah, it helps with a lot of things. And it's just, I, I just think it's an attractive rendering style. Yeah. Anyway, so we want to tell the particle system to use the weight paint. 
So we've selected the island again. We'll go to the white paint tab. And we go down to vertex groups. Why vertex groups? A weight paint is simply a vertex group. It's a collection of vertices, but they're not vertices which have all been selected with a value of one. It's a selection of vertices which have varying values from zero up to one. Vertex groups. And we can now define our hair with a weight paint for the density, for the length, for clumping, for kinking, for roughness, for twist, whole bunch of things we can do. This is complicated stuff, but we just want density. Click in the density value box. What have we got? We've only got one. We've only got one vertex group, and it's imaginatively called group. But I mean, suddenly our rocks are clumped or clustered or grouped just as we would like them to be. Still too many rocks, I think. I'm going to go up to the top. I'm going to go to emission, reduce the number to maybe a couple of hundred. You'll notice, incidentally, that these are embedded into the landscape. So they're actually sticking through underneath. What do you think is the reference point for the rocks when they're being distributed on the surface? Which point in the rock is Blender using as the point that's going to be placed on the surface? The origin. Let's go to reference. And... I'm going to have to zoom out here. Reference, click there. Here's our rock. Where is its origin? It's right in the middle. So this is useful when you're distributing trees, which we're going to be doing later, not tonight, but later in the semester. You want to make sure that the origin point for your tree is actually down at the bottom of the trunk not in the middle of the volume of the tree. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of very stunted looking trees in your landscape. So again, click on the box. This here hides and shows the reference collection. This actually switches it on and off. So you can't, you don't even get an eye. Uh, there's a subtle difference between these, I'm sure. I haven't found it yet, but I probably will discover it eventually. Anyway, play around with this, see how you do. So good. There's our landscape. I'm going to save this file. Save. Can I use save? That's um, not actually seeing a file name here. I'm going to use save as, just to be sure. Go back to particles. And we're going to call this island underscore zero one, enter to lock, enter to save, and we close. Sorry, how do, how do I apply my, sorry.